Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. My name is Richard Cooper, and I'm the president and CEO of New York Spin, a not-for-profit corporation. And pleased to announce uh, two new gold sponsors tonight, uh, Netcom Learning. Okay, also Turn to Tech, a New York City tech school and free co-working space. Big Visible has been a sponsor for several years, and we greatly appreciate their support. Our hosting sponsor this evening, Havas is providing the space and the food tonight. Okay. I, made, I met Michael Ma around 1995, when I was consulting at J.P. Morgan and working there with Tony also. And he was consulting, and Michael was consultant and vendor, providing a product called Slim from his company, QSM Associates. Tonight's presentation will be his seventh for NY Spin, making him our most popular speaker. <laughs> Michael's previous presentations have included Ugly Teams, Managing Difficult Conversations in Offshore and Agile, The Good, the Bad, and the Puzzling, the Agile Experience at Five Companies, Agile Management Methods, Old Goats versus Young Bucks, a Young Goats Observation on Productivity Metrics and Internet Speed Deadlines, and Extreme Programming and Productivity Measurement, where he caused a bit of controversy during that 1997 event when he reported that offshore developed software projects have 2.8 times as many bugs as average software projects. I have no idea what statistics Michael might have for us tonight, but I'm sure they'll be interesting. So I'll stop talking now and say, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Ma. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm back at home. Um, I'm a Lower East Side kid whose grandfather had a butcher shop on Mulberry Street. And now I'm back. So let me tell you a little bit about where we're going from Mulberry Street. I'm about to start an international incident with Germany. Okay. So a little bit of background about uh, how I got into this racket of having given seven New York spin talks. Um, I grew up in this area. My father was a Wall Street trader. He was kind of like the character in The Pursuit of Happiness where he was struggling as a young father with me as a little boy and one day while he was serving drinks at a bar on 33rd Street and 2nd Avenue a Wall Street trader type said Chris you should come down and uh, take our internship program and become a portfolio trader so he did now wanting the best for me when I was a teenager he said you should come to Wall Street and you're such a big mouth and you're arguing with me all the time, you should be a lawyer for M&A type of stuff in the finance markets. And I said, no way. I love rockets. I love engineering physics. I want to make stuff. And uh, even though for him, being a banker or a trader was when it was still an honorable profession. Now it's maybe less so, depending on who you ask. Uh, so I wound up getting involved in uh, physics engineering, went to school in Boston, Tufts University, uh, studied graduate school at Harvard, worked in dispute resolution, and I wound up uh, getting involved in the field of software. And let me fix this, excuse me, because I clicked out. So I like to say that I'm a city mouse that is now living in the country and one of the things I couldn't do when I was a kid was fly airplanes. So now I have a plane and I live in the country. And I got involved in software in an interesting way. My plane has no software in it. Uh, this is one plane. This is a short field landing on an airstrip near Washington, D.C., where if you go over it, you'll be in the water. So I get to live in the country and every now and then come back to my beloved New York and be here in the city. That's another plane at my airfield which has no software in it. It's only got a couple of instruments. Um, you can see the RPMs from the tachometer, the airspeed, and your altitude, and that's it. And so I fell in love with aviation because being an engineer, being a scientist, I was fascinated with things like meteorology, physics, 
the whole essence of machines uh, as opposed to working on Wall Street and trading all kinds of things and making lots of money. But I wound up actually in Great Neck, New York at one point after I finished my engineering career at Tufts in physics and all that, working on nuclear submarines. So on nuclear submarines out in Lake Success in Long Island, I worked on a system that was the software for the Trident II. Trident II is two football fields long, no windows, and you have to navigate this massive ship with software. And um, it's kind of complicated because you don't want... We're going to disregard the alarms. <laughs> Get ready for the alarms. Anyway, so I worked on code for this vehicle, which was intended to keep the peace. Being a child of immigrants who escaped during the war, when uh, during World War II, say 70 million people were killed in that conflict, 24 million from China. I'm of Chinese descent, 26 million from Russia. Uh, and the rest from the rest of the world. We believed in making software that would keep the world safe if you believed in the idea of deterrence. And for the most part, it did. But one thing I learned about writing code or working on code on submarines was that there was uh, a remarkable amount of complexity and sophistication that required this thing to work flawlessly. It had to be bug free. Because here you are navigating, talk about instruments, it's quite different from a Piper Cub or a Cherokee 180. And everything was about the sensors and the gyroscopes and the sonars and all of the kinds of instrumentation that navigated these vehicles that was about keeping our country safe. Um, and one of the things that we found as I was doing my research in the 1980s was that how do we predict bug curves? How do we understand how software behaves from the standpoint of defects, quality and reliability? And this is what we found. We found that bugs rise to a peak and taper down to a long tail. And this was from the research by a guy named Larry Putnam, who was the chief scientist of QSM at the time. And the idea around creating code that was clean was to find bugs early and frequently and have that tail be short without a big peak. The idea behind Agile is to accomplish just that. So think about if you work and you build code that is intended to be clean from the start so that you can finish sooner, you're looking at shrinking this curve. If your curve has got a big peak and a long tail, think about what that does to your ability to make a date. Right? And so we learned about how to understand this tail and how to shrink it. And I'll tell you, in spite of all the beeps, uh, that the way we did it was an interesting way in the 1980s. We put people together in pairs. What a novel idea. As a director of the integration testing and the integrated test program plan, I had to write tests before we wrote code. So we looked at the overall mission of what the software had to do. And we wrote all of the test cases before the programmer started designing the code. So now they had the ITPP, as it was called, which traced all of the test cases right back to the requirements. And they wrote the code. And this code curve, or this bug curve, on nuclear submarine software, and think about it, if you're driving a nuclear submarine with 24 nuclear missiles on board, each with six warheads, with each warhead being about six to 10 Hiroshima's, you better not have a bug in the code. So that was something that we did before there was something known as test-driven development, before there was something known as pair programming. And so I like to say, wow, I didn't know it at the time, but when I was a young engineer, we were doing Agile before Agile was cool or before Agile even had a name. So 
uh, with that, we wound up moving forward in the industry and I wound up learning more about how to build software that was different uh, based on some of the ideas that I was baptized in when I was a young, young professional first getting into the field. So fast forward a little bit and then we have things like the Agile Manifesto and doing things that after the SEI and CMM we wanted to do things that weren't waterfall and find out whether or not we could really build code in this new way. And I said, well, we already knew how to do that. So uh, as part of the Cutter Consortium, because I have two, two roles, I write research and I publish articles through a think tank outside of Boston called Cutter. It uh, was actually one of the organizations that absorbed Ed Jordan's early newsletters, American Programmer, and I wrote for American Programmer. So when American Programmer wound up going to uh, Cutter, I wound up being part of Cutter. Uh, we wound up finding that we wanted to look at software and measure it and take it on the road to talk about what were new ways of building code. And so there's Tom DeMarco at one of our Cutter conferences. Excuse me. Uh, we've taken this message to Columbus, Ohio, the Path to Agility, the Agile 2000X conferences, overseas to the OPE conference in Munich, Germany, and Agile development practices and better software in Las Vegas and down in uh, Orlando. So we wound up f taking the show on the road as early as the two early 2000s, 2002, 2003. And the way it started was working with Jim Highsmith, who was the director of the Agile practice at Cutter, and I was the director of the benchmarking practice. So we put together Agile and measurement and came up with a whole new candy, right? Peanut butter, chocolate, there you go, you got a Reese's peanut butter cup. So one day, as I was thinking about expanding our knowledge and our awareness of what we're seeing around the world, I wound up being asked to give a keynote talk in Columbus, Ohio. A fellow named Bart Murphy said, the other Agile keynote is going to be uh, Ken Schwaber. We'd like you to do the afternoon keynote and talk about what you're seeing. Because in Columbus, Ohio, there's this remarkable, vibrant community that's looking at building software with these new principles. So I said, okay, let's go ahead and talk about what we're finding out in our research. And there's a fellow there named, uh, who was it? Not only Bart Murphy, but Ben Blancara, who now works with a company called Pillar Technologies. And we were having sushi, and he said, let's talk about a sushi manifesto. The idea here is that we believe that there's something really special going on in this community, but how do we know? Could we take what you've been doing all around the world, looking at how projects behave and apply it here to Columbus? So I said, sure. So we came up with this quacky, weird idea. Columbus takes on the world. So in our QSM, or Quantitative Software Management Library of Project Statistics, which now is about 12,000 projects, increasingly more data is on Agile teams. Columbus said, let's take on what's going on in the QSM database, database by looking at companies in our area and compare them. And I said, okay, let's do it. So uh, we use the same techniques that I do in my consulting and our research, and we put a challenge out there to Columbus. We said, okay, whether you're Nationwide Insurance, Huntington Bank, Worthington Industries, come on in. We're going to do one study and split the cost 10 ways if we get 10 companies, and we're going to see how you guys do against our research statistics. Are you, being, are you able to build software with fewer bugs? Is your bug curve shrinking? And from that, are you able to hit time to market in a more ag aggressive, faster way than your competitors? And we'll compare you against the world. So that's what we did. Uh, the QSM Slim Bit database, uh, QSM, as you may know, stands for Quantitative Software Management, and Slim stands for S Software Lifecycle Management, has companies like this name brands that we all know and love. Some of you in this audience I've actually worked with and your names are up there from the companies that we've done work together. And we're able to create what I've affectionately called the Kelly Blue Book 
of software project statistics. So you can compare how projects are behaving against this library of statistics. Now we wanted to know whether Kent Beck was right. So Kent Beck, as you know, is the father of XP, pair programming, and he said agile projects can be considered more successful in the sense that they deliver more functionality with fewer bugs. Another way to translate that is you deliver more functionality, the same functionality in a faster time with fewer bugs. So let's see if he was right. right? So with the Columbus study, I'm going to jump to the answer, to the end of the book. If you wanted to skip ahead and see what the conclusion is to this great novel, we found that there were 75% fewer defects, or one-fourth the bugs in the companies that participated in this study. And they were able to deliver 30% faster. Now think about that. For every 100 bugs that everybody else has to find and fix, you only have to deal with finding and fixing 25. And for every 10 months that it takes for other folks to build a certain amount of code, you do it in seven, right? Wow, okay, so it works according to Kent Beck's criteria. Do you meet this? Yes. So I took this story to Germany. I wound up getting a call one day and a woman named Frances Paulish who works for Siemens said, we'd love you to be a speaker in Munich to talk about what you're seeing in the United States. So I said, okay, I'll go over and give a talk about what we're seeing on Agile Project Data in the US and talk to the Germans. So I flew over, went over to Germany. This is a number of years ago. I've been there for maybe four or five years in a row now. And I presented the results. So this is Marian Platz, right in the center of Munich. Uh, this is the uh, OOP conference location at the conference center just outside of Munich. This is the SIGS Datacom uh, conference space. This is the conference company that actually creates all of this uh, gathering of companies that are in Germany and Austria and Switzerland to come and hear what's going on in the software engineering community. Big displays. And I gave a talk. I gave a talk that said, okay, Agile redefines economics. What we're seeing from recent Agile research in the US. And this got the Germans into a frenzy. They really wanted to know what were you guys doing over in the United States because Agile was starting to make its way across the pond into Europe. Right? So I gave a talk. There's Gunther Furmeister. You couldn't get a more German name than Gunther Furmeister. Right? And I gave this keynote. And it was extremely well received by people who were really curious wanting to know what we're seeing in the United States. I gave a workshop on how would you capture data on Agile? How would you know? How would you gather the metrics that would tell you whether you're faster and your bugs are lower? So we had a great amount of fun out there. And I said, I've got data from, say, these five case studies. So I put it out there. We had North America, actually up in Toronto, Chicago, uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, and uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And I said, we're finding the truth. We're actually getting some of the facts behind the hype. So we used our database, which we call Slim Metrics, to overlay projects against industry trends from our research. And I presented what we're seeing in the States. So this is some photographs of a company outside uh, Chicago in McHenry, Illinois. I've used this company as a case study in the past in previous spin meetings, but if you didn't come to those talks before, this is a quick recap. This is called Follett Software in McHenry, Illinois. And their software is about educating children. So their purpose, their why, why are we doing this, is about raising the next generation to solve the challenges and the problems that we helped create and leave for them. So this is uh, a team at Follett where we collected the data. These are photographs of their environment at the time where they broke down all of the cubicles and they put everybody in one large room, pretty noisy room. Uh, these were the 
environments where you look and you see what, what's around the pair of programming stations near the keyboards, it are, you, you'll see that there are photographs of children. And part of the mission of Follett was we're in the business of educating children. We're going to buy into the whole idea of a 40-hour work week. We believe that a tired mind is not an effective mind, and we don't want you to work overtime. We're going to do the whole Kent Beck Kool-Aid thing. We want you to go home, do homework with your kids, and have dinner with them. So interestingly, when you look, you see photographs of kids photographs of kids, people working, and then going home. So their why was about their purpose of building software to educate the next generation. Again, you see under each workstation screen, photographs of their families. And they really meant it. They said, we don't want you coming in here tired. We want you to go home and do homework with your kids. So, the long and the short of it is, their executives were asked to meet with me where I could present one slide that would summarize everything from our research on their projects and follow it. I said, okay, how do I do this in one slide for the CEO, the CFO, the CIO, the VP of engineering, blah, 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 and do it in an hour? I said, okay, I'm going to show you from our research database for the amount of software that is the typical size of what you build, what it takes for other folks in industry to build it, in terms of cost, 3.5 million in this column. How long does it take them? 12 and a half months. How many bugs do you have to find during test and QA? That last part of that Rayleigh bug curve. So if your bug curve is really high and long, that number is going to be big. If your bug curve is low and small, that number is going to be small. And how does your number, how do your numbers in these columns, staffing at the end, compare against industry. So Follett's was not 3.5 million, which was the industry average for a certain amount of functionality with 35 people to build that code. They were doing it for 1.3 million less. 2.2 million. Now across seven releases, you take that 1.3 million multiplied by seven, and that's their yearly cost reduction in building code for their teams. So take 7 times 1.3 and you got a bigger number, right? Like 8.2 million, right? <coughs> 8.1. Schedule, instead of building it 12 and a half months, it's almost 5 months faster because their bugs were so low. Half of what the industry average is. So they don't have to keep testing, they ship it. They're done sooner. 5 months sooner, 1.2 million dollars, 1.3 million dollars less. So according to the Kent Beck criteria, they're building it faster and they're building it with fewer bugs. Great. So Agile captures the right me metrics for our model, SLIM. Uh, we collect, excuse me, let me back up, the velocity, the burn up, the burn down. We collect the team headcount across however many iterations, say 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We capture the cumulative amount of functional delivery and stories and story points and the amount of software that it takes to build that, and then the bugs. So that goes right into the database and it's an easy match. This is what it looks like when we do a sketch. So during the story phase, they had two folks working from mid-December to June for five and a half months. 11 person months of effort. If you take two people over 5.5, that's about 11 person months. If you multiply by a 40-hour work week, you can figure how many work hours that they, that they worked to produce the story uh, definitions. 20 folks in sprint one, two, three, four, five, six, going three months, and then kicking up to, say, 26 folks for another three and a half months. And we can figure out the amount of effort or work hours or work months over those six, six and a half months with that team of 20 to 26 people. They built 83 stories, 250 story points, and a certain amount of Java and XML. And when they did testing, they had to find this many bugs to, to fix, find and fix. So that's it, four basic metrics, which Agile teams collect better than their old waterfall teams. 
right? So we can do these benchmarking exercises and drop it into a data record and then figure out how they compare against a trend. So we did this six times and we looked at, say, schedules when they built a certain amount of functionality in six months. How did that compare against industry? Is industry eight months, nine months, ten months? So on that previous release, 5.0, it was about six months and the industry average was about ten. So Ken Beck would say, okay, we're building more functionality because we're doing in six months with other people taking ten. We looked again at one, two, three, four, five more releases to see, is this a fluke? Is this a one-shot deal? No, they repeated it five different times. So from small, medium, large, going from left to right for the amount of stories and the amount of code, we compare it against the industry average, which is a center line from our research database. And all we have to do is like do a curve fit through the data and get a line uh, a regression line and then see what the difference is in the distance between the lines. And we found that it was about 30%, 40% faster than the industry average. In some cases, twice as fast. Right? Now let's look at bugs. Bugs, in terms of the number of bugs that they had on that long tail or short tail on the back end of their QA and integration testing, so if they found 120 bugs for release five, right here, what was the industry average? More like double. Okay, same thing with six, seven, not five, seven, zero, oh, eight, zero. Oh, as we go to larger releases on the right, all of the data is below the line. Right, so this is all you have to do to be a metrics analyst using SLIM. How many dots are above the line, which is more bugs found interesting, how many are below? They're all below. And so what we're finding was their curve was shrunken. And it was because of the social environment, working together, writing tests first, pairing. Now why would pairing create cleaner code? What might you say? Why? So, there. Someone's, someone's expecting it as it's being built. That's right. Someone's looking at it as it's being built. So you're getting like an instant code review. If I were a pilot and I was flying in left seat and I had a co-pilot in right seat, everything that I'm doing is being observed and watched by a co-pilot. Two sets of eyes, right? So if I'm missing something and I'm dialing in a wrong frequency or making a wrong radio call, it's going to be caught by a co-pilot, which is why when you go in a Boeing airplane, there are two pilots. Right? They don't say, why should we pay two pilots to fly one plane? Nobody says that in Boeing or Airbus or United Airlines or American or Delta. They want two pilots there. So think about that. We get instant code reviews. So Kent Beck says, okay, the data is correct. We're seeing faster schedules and fewer bugs. So that brings us to Columbus. So that's an example of how we would do this study. We said we'll do the same kind of technique in Columbus. So we captured data. We we went out there in Columbus and we had the study. But we also said, all right, Munich, what about you? We'll do a Munich study, all right? So we then said, what about Munich versus Columbus? If we use the same technique in a US city where Agile is taking hold and we use that method in Germany, what would it look like? Is it like a Bobby Flay throwdown? You know, you challenge to a throwdown. So I had this, I'm a Food Network junkie, so you know, I thought, why don't I make this talk like an agile throwdown, right? So, what would it, what, if you were to summarize the kind of information that we need for each data record, what would it look like? Well, here's a simple summary by one of, our, one of the companies that took part in the study. They said, okay, we had a release that was four months, eight sprints. We had 10 people working over those four months and they delivered 139 stories and using our scale, 553 story points and to deliver that functionality it was this amount of new code and we changed our code base from existing libraries for 7,615 lines of change code. You add the two together, we can figure out the software that implemented those stories 
and we found 45 bugs during QA testing. Now, if you can get information like that, you could get data for a study like a New York study. So, here's the answer, Columbus and Munich. You ready? Okay. Speed. Kent Beck's criteria number one. We looked at schedules for projects that were 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, however many here in the green dots. Smaller projects on the left, larger projects on the right, average in the middle. Plotted their schedules, two, four, five months against a trend line. So this is the QSM database, the average trend line. This is the upper end of the bell curve where you're that much slower and this is the lower end of the bell curve when you're that much faster. All right, so this is Columbus, Ohio, and we do a line through that, and we can see, is the green line above the black line? Yes. By how much? About 30%. So for every 10 months, the Columbus teams are seven. Munich, red dots. You can even see, before I put the trend line on, that there's an interesting split. On some of the projects here on this side, they're faster than the average, and a whole bunch are longer. We'll throw a line through it, and it's kind of like a split behavior, right? On the left side of the crossover point, you could say these projects are faster than the average, and on this side, they take longer. Put the Columbus projects back on and put the lines back through and you be the judge. Is the red line or the green line below or faster than the other? What do you see? Columbus wins. Columbus wins. The green line is kind of parallel to the industry average and it's lower. At this point there's a crossover so anything beyond here, Americans are faster than the Germans. Okay, we win. The x-axis is small, medium, large amounts of functionality, either story, story points, or delivered software. So smaller on the left, t-shirt size, large on the right. Vertical axis is time. So if I built this much, this many stories of this much code in four months, the vertical is four months. All right. A bug's life. Bugs. This is the Columbus data. Remember, one-fourth the bugs compared to the QSM database. I can draw a line through that, and that represents about 25 out of every 100. One-fourth the bugs. Test-driven development, pair programming, all of that stuff that was in the environment or the practices for the Columbus teams. Germany. draw a line through that and you can see that it's not quite like Columbus. Put the data together, put the lines on, which line is below the other line. Everything from here on, about 8,000 lines of code on up, 10, 20, 30, 40, 100,000 lines of code and corresponding amount of stories and story points, the green line is below the red line. So fewer bugs in the U.S. data compared to the Germany data. Yes? That's coming up in the next slide. So, thanks very much. So let's figure out what might be going on. Go ahead. We have twice as many data points for Columbus as Right. So, how does Apple staff have well, that's a good question. So the question is, well, we got more data points in Columbus and fewer in Munich, but that's not going to stay that way. The Germans are still collecting more data, and we're going to get more red data points, and in February, I'm going back. All right, so we'll see. It's kind of like, let's add more data to the sample. But for this initial sample, where I said, okay, let's take what we got as of now, because I've got to go and give the talk, All right? Let's see what we got. Okay, teams, Columbus. Interestingly, with the exception of from here to the left, 
the team size, six, seven, eight, ten folks, is about typical. It's neither higher number of engineers and developers nor lower. On this side of the fence, smaller releases, it tends to use, they tended to use larger numbers of folks. So that's kind of interesting. That's a curve fit through the headcount. Now interestingly, there's a belief that says Agile works best in small to medium sized teams. And yet, for projects going all the way up until here, you could argue that the US companies are throwing more people on a project. Why would we tend to throw more people on a project? Why would we say, get it done, let's, let's add you know, two, four, six, however many people? Richard? We think it'll make it faster. All right, so we tend to have this time-driven mentality. Think about Agile. Everything's in the adjectives or language of speed, sprints, velocity, agility, right? So we tend as a culture to put more people on a project. And that's generally what we see in the US. The Germans, however, tend to say, let's watch this thing. Let's take it a little slower. Let's not quite jump whole hog into it. So we tended to see all but three of the projects staffed with smaller teams, fewer people. Let's just try this agile stuff out before we go hog wild on it. So that was an interesting thing that we saw when we cons looked across the German teams. And for the most part, for anything above a small project, they tended to be very conservative in how many people they threw on a project. Now, let me ask you a question. If you tend to be more conservative and not have as many folks on a team, what do you think happens to schedule? Do you do it faster or do you take longer? Fewer people, generally speaking, you take longer. Maybe that might explain why we're seeing the trade-off where we throw more people on it and we're getting done sooner. Now let me ask you a question. If you take a project and you throw more people on it with the intent of getting it done faster, do you think bugs tend to go down or do they tend to go up? They tend to go up. A lot of people here are saying up, up, up nodding their heads. But how would you mitigate that? You might mitigate that by practices that deal with minimizing the communication difficulty, complexity. You might have stand-up meetings. You might have iteration planning meetings, retrospectives. Right? You might pair people. You might co-locate them. If you don't pair people and spread, and you don't co-locate them, by all means, as you throw more folks on a project, you'll probably see bugs climbing unless you have something in your practices that is about maximizing the communication or minimizing the miscommunication. So putting this all together, staff in Columbus and Munich, what do you got here? Interesting. The lines kind of go parallel, but which line is lower? which uses a smaller team generally than the other, the red, Germans, right? So Germans as a whole, if I were to stitch these graphs together and put some statements on it, I would say they tend to be more, more conservative, they use smaller teams, they tend to take longer time versus the United States, which tends to throw more people on it, we're like time to market driven, and we do it faster. Now effort and cost, you would think that if I use large teams versus small teams, what would that come by? How would that look? This is Columbus in person months, person weeks, person hours. It's kind of split, but generally speaking, above 10,000 lines of code or however many stories, we tend to see lower effort and cost because we're hitting faster schedules. So we may have larger teams, so we'll be getting done sooner and then we're shutting it off and we're not spending as much after delivery. Germans kind of like parallel. So although, although they're using larger team or smaller teams, they're not getting quite as fast schedules, so they're booking more hours and booking more cost as they go along. When the project's done at Elevate, at Go Live, tally it all up not that much different from industry average because they're not really getting the schedule performance quite yet. 
So that's the US data versus the German data. So from 100,000 lines of code or less, the Germans are building systems at lower cost, but they're taking longer time. Right? So Michael, does it actually mean that, go back to the previous thing, does it actually mean that for smaller projects, using Agile takes longer time than industry average because green line is about black line? Yeah, well, when I looked at the companies that were in the Columbus study, because it's like Columbus versus Munich, right? I tended to find that regardless of whether a project was small, medium, or large, they still used a fairly one-size-fits-all number of headcount, right? Eight, 10, 12 people or something like that. They didn't kind of say, you know what? We don't really need an army of folks to build something that's on the small end. Let's just throw, you know, tailor down the size of the team. So they didn't flex. So they kind of had a more, you know, we'll just like throw 10 people on it or whatever. And so it made the behavior of schedule and defect performance kind of like split, right? So that's why you saw a slope in the line was the Germans were more uniformly, let's just use, you know, small teams. And the black line is the industry Industry average. So the overall score, USA 2, right? Germans 1. Tony. Could you repeat that, Tony? Are they all equal in complexity? You know, that would be a tricky uh, s s question to answer unless we looked at the, a complexity metric for all of the dozen and a half Columbus projects uh, and all of the Germany projects. For the most part, the only way I could say we're looking at apples to apples is if we're looking at business IT information systems as opposed to complex systems that fly airplanes, Airbus, okay? So we looked at one application type. Now inside the application type, we didn't get a chance to go further yet to say within that window, how much more difficult the less difficult, but that would be an interesting question. But on the overall uh, scenario, we seem to see that the Germans were more conservative on dipping their toes in Agile, whereas the Americans were generally going more whole hog and we saw from the measures that the patterns seem to exhibit that. So, I'm gonna summarize for a minute to say, we're looking at outcomes in terms of how fast are we able to build something and what's our quality using the Kent Beck criteria, but it's really an effect of different practices, right? It's philosophies. How do we build systems collaboratively together in this new engineering space? Well, first, Short feedback loops seem to be a common criteria or a characteristic of this agile thing. But I would say that working on a nuclear submarine program before the word agile was even coined, we emphasize short feedback loops, okay? In Lake Success of Great Neck, New York, we had one big room. We didn't have offices. Everybody sat together so that if you had a question for the, you know, the inertial navigation folks from the sonar folks, you could like literally wheel your chair around, right? So short feedback loops are not necessarily owned by folks that say we're agile. You could be waterfall or whatever and achieve short feedback loops. Great. High bandwidth communication. The idea of daily stand-ups, iteration planning meetings, retrospectives, okay? All of that information flow is about moving information around because ultimately we're trying to take smart people, put them together, build it in the code, all right? If you have to push it through a garden hose, it's a lot different than if you got a wide open pipe. Transparency, Ken said transparency is a great floodlight. People who thrive in political maneuvering hate scrum, all right? So we're really talking about having things open. We're talking about metrics on velocity and burn up. We're talking about visibility on burn down, visibility on risk, visibility on all of the things. What did I do today? What do I need to do tomorrow? What's in my way? Okay, transparency, openness. Avoiding burnout. So when Follett said, if you're tired, you're not creative. And when we're talking about the business of software, it's about being creative. We don't want you tired. One thing that I was kind of stunned about when I'm walking around here is how many people are working late. 
you know? <laughs> like, wait a minute. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> What's that? But they came in at 11. But they came in at 11. Good. So they're well rested because they had a lot of sleep. Great for them. So what? Right? What matters? Why? What, what about it all? And so I think about this because I think, you know, we're not going to be here forever, you know. Our time here is finite. What are we doing this all for? So the first company that I did some of these measurements, it was because they were involved in medical systems. And their code was about saving lives. And they said, people buy our product because of the software and because of the quality of our software. And this software is in laboratory instruments and hospitals. Right? I once worked with a company in Maryland, uh, Becton Dickinson was their name, and they were writing code to identify systemic blood infections as fast as you can to find out if you had septicemia. So if you go into an emergency room and you have a blood infection, you could be dead in 24 hours. And their code was about finding it as fast as you can because if they needed to hit you with antibiotics, it was a matter of minutes or hours where they could save your life or not save your life. And the remarkable story that I had at that company in Bethesda, Maryland was I met with the team, they were building the code, and then a year later I went back and this guy, we'll call him Derek, was really proud of the code he wrote and they were really about keeping the bugs way down and delivering high quality software and they told me a story about this guy Derek when I met with the team again. They said, you're not going to believe this, but one day Derek got sick. One day he was rushed to the emergency room. He was really sick, his fever was spiking. They ran all kinds of analysis, analysis on his blood. And the Becton Dickinson system was the instrument that measured his blood sample. And they saved his life because of the code he wrote. Right? Like, whoa! So not only was he about having this higher purpose of doing what he did as a software professional, because that was his why. Like, why are you doing this? Well, I'm working in the medical field and medicine is important to me. So even though I'm a software engineer, I'm about helping people and health, right? He saved his own life. You might be writing code to deal with the fact that we have an overstressed planet, all right? We have to deal with the fact that today, in 2013, it's a very different world than it is, it was 10, 15, or 20 years ago, maybe before our children were born. You might be dealing with environmental or climate change. And the code that you write is dealing with the fact that we have more extreme weather in the history of mankind that we've ever seen before. There was an insurance company exec who gave a talk in Columbus, of all places, and he said, I'm going to show you a map, and every state that's colored, say, orange, is where we've seen the more, most extreme weather that we've ever seen in the history of measurements. He said, are you ready? And he threw up the map, and it was all orange. All 50 states were seeing more extreme weather than we had ever seen in recorded history. And there are companies that are trying to deal with that, whether you're an insurance company, dealing with processing claims from a Hurricane Katrina or a Sandy, which blasted through a lot of my friends' neighborhoods in New Jersey and Long Island. You know, we're trying to deal with the fact that we have a very changing world. You could be writing code that's dealing with power, alternative energy. My son goes to school up in Vermont, so his dad grew up here on the Lower East Side, Mulberry Street. My grandfather's meat market was you know, just south of Canal, and now my son goes to a school where they're really all about sustainability. Putney School, Putney, Vermont. All right? They milk cows as part of their work study program. Okay? They grow organic gardens. They have a net zero energy building for their student center. And they're trying to look at what do we do in this world where we need different forms of energy than just draining the tank. You could be educating children. So Fallout Software is all about creating educational solutions for the next generation. So we don't really think about these things, about the why 
that we're doing what we're doing, but we really are. In some intangible way, we're doing things for a larger purpose. So why not do it in the best way that we can, right? And so this is the creativity and the, and the innovation that we're looking at producing as we say, how do we do work better? We might be dealing with the fact that, gosh, when I was born, there were three billion people on the planet. Today, there are seven. My son said to me, 17, he said, Dad, I was only born 17 years ago. What's it going to be like when I'm your age? How many people are going to be on the planet? And I said, well, according to UN population studies, we're going to cap out at about 10 to 12. We're already at 7. It was 3 when I was born. So you're going to have to deal with a world that's going to be vastly different than the one I grew up in. And I hope technology is going to be part of that solution. In Norway, when I was filling up my gas tank after giving a lecture in Oslo on this very topic, I looked at that price of kroner per liter, and I did the calculation, and that's almost 12 bucks a gallon. We freak out when it goes above four, right? But this is the way of life outside the United States. Uh, so what will we do as we wind up finding our energy needs and our medical costs being the two big drivers of our companies, right? We're going to have to be more creative and innovative in finding solutions. And a lot of it is going to be us, right? We're writing code. We're building knowledge-based systems that are going to basically be human thought inside a machine, moving information around. That's why we're doing this. Is that it? No. There's more. So, I said this to Munich, Germany, after I had the Columbus data, and I said, here's what we're seeing in the United States. What about you Germans? And like I'm starting an international incident because the Germans just say, well, we, you know, we're Germans. We're engineers. We'll take you guys on. And I'm going back in February saying, eh, you know, we win, you know, kind of. Until this catches hold and building systems and doing things in a more innovative way are going to spread. It's not just a bunch of guys in Salt Lake City, Utah comes up with an idea. Now it's really starting to go global. So what would it look like <coughs> if we were to say, how about our teams? When we build code, we build this much functionality, we do it in this many sprints, we do it with this many people and this much cost, what would we look like? So we now have trends in our library that are agile trends. As data is coming in, we're now doing curve fits through schedule, headcount, effort, bugs. And now in our most recent release of Slim 8.1, we're now pushing to the desktop agile trends. So we say, you know what? You don't need to hire Michael Ma. You don't need to have me come in and do a benchmark study. You do it. You do a sketch. You look at your story phase. You look at the number of sprints. You look at your burn up, your burn down, and how many stories or story points, how much software you built, and the bugs that were in the code during testing. Do it yourself. So we're having a lot of fun with this. We're pushing this out to the desktop, making it very democratic, and saying, what would it look like for you folks if you were to self-measure? And so are you curious? You know? Maybe when we find out whether or not we're finding that this stuff works or doesn't work, if it works, we'll tell people about it. And we'll say, you know what? Like Follett Software, you folks were skeptical, Mr. and Mrs. Management, CFO, CIO, CEO, and all those cats, because all along while we were doing this, you were hanging over our heads. Maybe we should do it in India. Maybe we should offshore it to Eastern Europe, right? Do it in Singapore. There are lower cost programmers out there, and we can reduce our cost because the CFO is crawling up our butt to lower our expenses, right? So now, interestingly, in this global environment, we see here in the United States, we're competing against folks beyond our borders. And if we're doing great, let's show it. If we're not, well, we've got to find out what's going on and we've got to fix it, right? Transparency. Because behind you know, all of this, people are always going to be looking for a better way. Are you going to be doing it better than other, other folks, right? 
I'm working with a little credit card company out like MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and they're having to fight for whether or not they keep their, data, keep their development center because there's threats where management is saying, maybe we should just do it with one of these like Capgemini folks or IBM Global or something like that. So, show me the money or show me the monkey. Right? I loved Curious George when I was a kid. I'm curious. And that's kind of what gets me all about, you know, juiced up about this stuff. I really am excited and blessed to be able to go into different companies and see what's going on. So you're invited. I'll throw it out there. If you think that this might be an interesting way of look-seeing, show me the monkey, let me know. We can find out whether or not we should create a New York takes on Germany. Right? Come on, we're New Yorkers, right? Let's take on the Germans. Let's take on those people in the Midwest, Columbus, Ohio. What do they got on New Yorkers? So anyway, that's my way of just maybe starting an international incident. <laughs> it's kind of a fun trick. You know, Bobby Flay, I challenge you to an Agile throwdown. And that's where we're going. So if you have any questions, uh, this is my contact information. The guy who is coordinating the German study is my associate in Switzerland, Andrea Jelly, QSM associate Switzerland. His contact information is here too. But there I am. And we're done in an agile way early, right? Are we early? Did I have any bugs while I was giving my talk? Might have stumbled. But that's it. Anyway, so now we're going to open up the questions and open conversation because God bless you folks. You're not home with your family. You're not home with like eating dinner. You're here eating pizza on Hudson Street, hearing some guy spout off and pontificate about what I'm seeing all around the world. And I'm really grateful that you're here. So let's wrap it up and open it for questions. Thanks very much. What a crowd. Yes, back there. I'm curious about the companies. Did they stay stable over time? Did they, like in the Columbus set of, of uh, development teams, right. did they pick a number for the team and keep that number of people throughout the entire life cycle? Generally speaking, yes. In fact, I was just on a conference call. The question was, did in, in the study, for example, in Columbus, where the team's fairly stable. Um, generally speaking, yes. However, there are times that you just can't avoid that other companies are going to poach your folks. Right? So when you see a schedule stretch out and when you see effort numbers climb, sometimes when I do a retrospective and I say, tell me things that went well, things that went poorly, one of the things on the red list versus the green list might be we lost some critical staff in the middle. And then you might see like a productivity index drop, which is a weighted combination of, say, the velocity slowing down and the effort hours increasing. So sometimes staff turnover hits you. You also see sometimes that companies regress, right? So you might have somebody who's a real evangelist in this area. They're really trying to make a lot of change and then they get an enticing job offer and they go somewhere else and then the new gal or new guy that comes in says you know I'm going to kind of do it my way right and so you might see some change that way too so the world is very dynamic and a couple of the companies in the Columbus study I'll say are slipping they're regressing because a few of those folks I'm still in there helping them measure and we're watching the meter needle and whether it's starting to move up or down and in some of the companies, they're starting to slip. Like, so don't be so, don't have so much hubris, right? It's not forever. You could wind up uh, slipping and, not, and losing your advantage. So it's never an end game. This is not two to one and it's that way forever. It's going to always be dynamic and moving. So thanks very much for that question. Things do change. Yes, question here. I guess uh, what I couldn't understand is Columbus, it seems like they're using agile, using fair right. What are they doing different than Munich? What is Columbus doing different than Munich? Um, one of the things that I found was the vibrance 
of the economic development in the Columbus area. There is this youthful, energetic, um, enthusiastic culture. So you see companies that are looking at being at the cutting edge. There's a lot of medical systems uh, innovation going on there. There's a lot of, when you go out to the restaurants, you see a lot of these pretty girls, they work for Victoria's Secret, right? So limited brands is in Columbus, Ohio. There's a lot of um, uh, sense that we're going to push the envelope and be cutting edge. Interestingly, I don't know if this is a fair stereotype, but in Germany, they look at this stuff with skepticism until you can prove it. And maybe that's kind of the mentality of a more conservative engineering culture. In Switzerland, when I was in Zurich, we also saw people saying, I don't know about this agile stuff. So they tended to be more about dipping their toe in the water. Um, cultural change is a big part of a lot of this agile transformation. And maybe in some of those Teutonic or Germanic societies, it's not as readily open to listen to what those crazy Americans are doing. We should do it their way. You know, they have a lot, of, a lot of cultural pride. But you can really get a bear in their butt when you say, this is what we're doing. You know, what is your data saying? And we had people like flocking to our exhibit area where we were talking about these techniques. And everybody was saying, let's do this study. Right, here's my contact information and I'll get some of these data and whiteboard sketches and we'll fill it out in SLIM and tell us what it says. It was a real curiosity there, which was kind of interesting. So when I go back in February, who knows? If you invite me back, I'll say, what's the next chapter, the 2.0 study of Germany versus Columbus? It's going to change. It's always going to be dynamic. So we'll see. Yes? Uh, have you been exposed to any uh, curriculum projects at universities where they're doing agile programming, teaching students, exposing them? Uh, and, and second, uh, is that a good way for companies to look for agile talent to find? So the question is, are we seeing it in the academic uh, communities where in curriculums people are trying these ideas? My experience, not that it, it doesn't exist out there, my experience personally is no. I haven't come across these kind of like skunk works projects where we say, let's take these graduate students and let's do this and kind of take a look at it. So far, I mean, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but so far I haven't come across that personally. Doesn't mean that I might not. We'll see. Yes? You see better performance in the purest framework, or do you see more adaptability on the loose environment in these competitions? Do you see that? Do I see different results in a purism type of framework versus more like a random environment? So, let's see, the best way I might think about that question is this hypothesis, which I think is true. You get the best outcome, the best code, the best engineering. When you have the smartest people you can get, you put them in one place, and you have them work on one thing and you give them the best technology for them to do their jobs, right? So that, I would say, is the utopia of how would I want to work, right? Um, the more you go away from those four dimensions, so let's take, all right, maybe not the smartest people because they're the most senior and more expensive, so let's just kind of replace them with newbies off the school bus. All right, co-located, eh, you know, let's let people telecommute, let's split them up between four different cities, including folks in East Germany or Eastern Europe or India or Singapore and China. Um, single tasking, lean, you know, working on one thing, no, let's have them work on two or three, four things at the same time and give them a good dose of attention deficit disorder, right? Tools, nah, you know, who needs all of that latest debuggers or compilers or testing tools? Let's just kind of cut the budgets. The more you keep doing shit like that, sorry, crap like that, stuff like that, I think you start to see a dilution of what you say, what's the ideal, right? I always think that the ideal is going to give us the best outcome, if you can do it. So Steve Jobs, when he created the Mac architecture, said, I'm going to handpick the best people I know at Apple. I'm going to put them in one place called the Texaco Towers, right? I think it was in Palo Alto or something like that. It's near a Texaco station. And I'm going to have them work on one thing. And I'm going to hurl everything that I can to give them all the best technology of the resources of Apple to come up with the Mac architecture. And what do you got? 
right? So I think that that is the ideal. Now, is the ideal easily achievable and practical day to day? Maybe not. Maybe some of your smartest people may not be all in New York City on Hudson Street. Maybe some of them might be in Boston. Some of them might be somewhere else. So how do you deal with the geographic distance? Maybe a time change difference, right? Maybe a cultural difference if you're talking about, say, Chinese folk in Singapore and Americans here, you know, in Austin, Texas or something like that. There's different cultural styles and norms that impede data flow, information flow, communication. So I think we see that when we see the outcome varying in terms of productivity, time to market, cost, bugs. Those four meter dials are going to move depending on how you are at the quote ideal that you say or less than ideal. And it's not just like I stick an Agile sticker on it, that does it. It's about a lot of those different practices that I said that are about to bring about the outcomes. And you don't know whether they're working if you're not keeping track of metrics, right? There are still people that say, we don't need no stinking metrics, right? You can't measure productivity. And I'm still up here saying, well, I've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, you know? I mean, I'm not bored. I'm still finding some interesting patterns. So, great question. Great question. How much time do we have? We're, we're supposed to wrap up at five more, minutes. five more minutes of questions, and then we let you go home to your families. Then we have the raffle. We have the raffle. <laughs> right. Amazing that you guys are here. Are we having fun? Is this like, I'm not putting you to sleep, right? Okay, cool. All right. More questions. Five more minutes. One. Uh, several times you've mentioned India, Eastern Europe, Singapore, Singapore, India. Blah, 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 blah. blah. It's some, uh, someone who works for a company who is in Eastern Europe and is in Singapore. Right? Yeah. Right, right. right. How real is this conversation in the boardroom, CFO versus VP of Engineering? Uh, we've got to offshore you guys to whatever. No, let's save money using Agile instead. How real is that? Do you see a trend about that? Can you speak a little bit to this? It's real in a lot of companies. It's an ongoing struggle. And um, part of why some folks don't want to look is because they think, I don't want to measure. We suck, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, I kind of know it, and I don't want anybody else to know it, right? Um, because if I stick my head up in the air, I might get like shot. So it is tricky. And a lot of it is because we're having difficult conversations around the things that are not easily discussed. So um, I grew up in, you know, here in, on Mulberry Street, right? I'm of Chinese descent. When I grew up, I spoke Toisan, I spoke Hokusan, I spoke Cantonese, and, then, and when I went to college, I spoke Mandarin. It's embarrassing to me that when I hear somebody, when I was on my headset with a team from Shenzhen, China, that I couldn't understand their accents, right? So, I'm listening, it's 11 o'clock at night, I'm exhausted, it's 11 o'clock in the morning for them, you know, and the kids are asleep, and I'm trying to do a webinar, and I can't understand the thing they're saying because of their accent, but I couldn't say it. And so, if I were writing code, and I couldn't understand them, and they couldn't understand me, that's going to be a real tangible output in my outcome in my project. And it's a conversation that people aren't talking about, but it's still a reality in our work environments. So if I had folks that were from there that were working here and I was sitting next to them and I had trust and I had face-to-face -face and I was able to communicate better than through a headset which was dropping out every other syllable and, you know, embarrassingly, their Mandarin accent was so hard and I'm sure my English wasn't easy for them to understand either. It's not just me not understanding them, it's them not understanding me. We couldn't get the work done. I had to spend two and a half hours to do something that I normally take 40 minutes to do. And it was because I found it, you know, I'm pa chu, right? I don't want to be rude. So I didn't want to say to somebody, I don't understand what you're saying. Could you please repeat that? Because by the second or third or fourth time with me saying, could you repeat that question? I was like, man, I'm a dick. You know? And I'm going to like embarrass them. So I said, all right. I did what a typical Asian does. You just nod your head and smile, right? <laughs> so, do you think I understood what they were saying? No. And if I was writing code for them, let's say I was writing code for them. I hope this is right. You know, so it's still a real conversation, especially in this global environment. 
Uh, and the difficulty is we really have to be able to look at whether it's working for us or against us. Now sometimes we have really smart people over there and we'll suck up to the different time zones, right? And we'll find a way of mitigating that because one offsets the other. But you don't know if it truly offsets the other. But it's still a real thing. Um, we're seeing in Columbus that they just had this one large company pulled back an entire tour of major India outsource providers, you know, the Wipros, the Tatas, and all that stuff, because they realized that they also had an investment in their community, Columbus, Ohio. They didn't want to gut the employment base in Columbus, and they did believe that working collaboratively would be better for their communities if they co-located. So it's a real tough tension, real tough tension. A couple more, and then we'll... And then we'll wrap it because we, some people may want to get home. Okay. Yes? Uh, would you share, mind sharing some of the data you have about offshoring and how it is not cost effective or anything like that? Okay, quick, uh, quick answer on offshoring. I got in trouble on this. I, I gave a talk in, here at SPIN my, three, four years ago and said, here's what the data is showing. Um, 2.8 times higher defects in teams that were split across multiple time zones and offshoring. Not that there aren't smart people in Asia or India or Eastern Europe. The problem is the time zones and the feedback loops and the miscommunication. So 2.8 times more defects. Now, if you look at, say, in some of these Agile case studies, half the bugs compared to three times more, what's the end-to-end -end difference? Six, right? Six times more defects when you're splitting teams versus co-locating them. Could you mitigate that? Maybe, maybe. And that's where the creative stuff is. Like how can we tap into smart people being around in other places but not pay the penalty of miscommunication? One case today I didn't show is BMC Software Austin, Texas, where they had an India team, a couple of tech teams in Texas, and one in, in oh, somewhere in St. Louis or something like that. And they said, if we didn't use Scrum, if we didn't find a way of keeping this communication flow, we would not have succeeded with our offshore team, and we succeeded because of using Agile principles given our geographic distance. So that's, that's an interesting hypothesis. Are you familiar with data and research by Jeff Sutherland around uh, productivity for Scrum, including distributed Scrum or Type C Scrum? He's got a number of very interesting case studies. People have said that. They said, you need to talk to Jeff Sutherland and put like peanut butter and chocolate together and you guys make a Reese's peanut butter cup. I haven't met with Jeff. I've spoken certainly a lot with Ken Schwaber. I just saw him recently out in Columbus where he keeps coming back and I keep going back. But thanks for mentioning it. I'll maybe have to email Jeff Sutherland. He's collected those case studies. One of them happens to include my firm, but Oh. <laughs> well, talk to me and we'll talk about your firm. But. Uh, this is fun. This is kind of interesting in, in a really creative way. Uh, one last thing, and then we're going to do the raffle. That's your buddy there, Mark, who's slowing us down over there, okay? <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Mark Fiedler. One quick question that rides on the last question you had. How did you find productivity differences between offshore and onshore teams? How do you find productivity differences between offshore and onshore teams? I mean, did you find big differences? Did you find one better than another? Did you find it better? Okay, there's two different dimensions here, uh, meter needles. The productivity, which is a combination of fast and, and uh, low effort, fast and cheap. And then there's the quality dimension. We found that they were, we're seeing neck and neck productivity. The bug rates were different generally speaking, because of what we're seeing about the communication difficulty across time zones. So productivity, yes. Neck and neck. Bug rates, no. Three times higher when you split teams around. Now, it could be splitting them anywhere. As, once you start breaking time zones, and my 11 o'clock at night, when I'm exhausted and I'm tired and they're fresh and it's 11 o'clock in the morning, that's when the stuff just doesn't go in my head. You know, and that's where it comes out in mistakes and things that didn't quite go right in the code. I may make my date, but you know, hold your nose, maybe. Could be. So Wow, we could go on all night. <laughs> so let's not. Let's not. Let's wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you for bringing me back home to Canal Street. <laughs>